Thank you, Campbell family, for reading, and men for singing, and Bunny for giving us direction and support. Brennan for that children's story. Uh, it's great. He, um, he did have quite the experience in Africa, and I'm glad he can share more of that with you. Last week I talked a little bit about home. That was kind of the word. Um, and related to it is the word family. Some of you may know we did a series on words of life, and this is part of that idea, continuing with words that speak to life and give us life. Home is one of those places, but it's more than house we talked about. It's more than four walls. Uh, it's more than shelter. It's more than place. It is the loci of, of all that is important to us. It is where we receive nourishment. It is where we share love. It is the people who gather that make house home. And so today we're going to take the logical extension of that and talk a little bit about family. Now, I know that this idea isn't rocket science. You know, oh, great, I'm going to hear a sermon about family. Okay, how hard can this be? Well, it's not terribly hard, but I want to process and think through this with you a little bit theologically because there are implications for the way in which we start to think about God and the world around us that come out of this. The first observation I want to share with you about family is that church is changing in society, perhaps in great part because family is shifting in society. If we think about the post-war era, that is to say World War II I'm referring to, the era of the great generation, and we think about how families were structured, we know that there were far fewer divorces in our grandfather's era than in our father's era. Far fewer divorces. We know, too, that because the birth control pill hadn't yet been invented and wasn't mass marketed yet in the United States, that families were much larger across the board in post-war America as well. So families of the 1940s would have been much bigger, by and large, than families of the 1970s and 80s, for example. By then, people had, were making choices to have two, three, maybe four children, maybe even one or none, but not so in the post-war era. Many of us came from families that had six, nine, or 11 siblings in those generations. So family was big. The nuclear family was strong because of the rural structure of America and the farms and the return of labor to all of this, even the industrialized structures of the cities. People more often lived in extended family units. It was more common post-World War II for grandmothers and grandfathers to live in close proximity, if not in the same household, with their children and grandchildren. Family units were more tightly knit, and it's not a surprise that the church in that era boomed. It grew incredibly rapidly in the United States in the 19, late 1940s and throughout the 50s and early 60s. The Seventh-day Adventist church, kind of always a little bit behind the rest of the world, actually kept its growth up into the 70s, stopping about in the 80s. We, we lag by about a decade, it seems. But we grew through that period of time in great numbers. If you tour the United States and look around to see Adventist churches, you will find that many of them look exactly like this. Structures that were built more or less in A-frame construction in the mid-1960s or from 1958 to 1968. Huge numbers of our churches were constructed in that era because there was no room in the existing structures to contain the burgeoning number of people who were becoming Seventh-day Adventists at that time. The family structure post-war fueled a, a, a consistency, a stability in the church that was unparalleled in American history. So many people coming back from the war, having witnessed its horrors and deprivations, coming to church. And that post-war era really built the church. So I don't want to, uh, I, I want to make the point that the stability and the structure of families is very important. And that perhaps one of the reasons building church and maintaining church is much more difficult today is because of the changes in family structure. First of all, 
um, who can define a family anymore? It used to be that if you asked a child to draw a family, there might be a mother, a father, one or two kids, a dog, a cat. Now you could have anything from one person with 16 cats um, and define that somehow as family. It, it could be um, two women, two men might be defined as family with their children. It could be um, man, ex-wife, 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 new wife. Two children to the first wife, none to the second, three to the third, and one on the way with the fourth. Family. Uh, it could be the other way around. It could be wife, second husband, first one died, third, whatever. You figure it out. Who are you to the people around you? Well, I'm his brother's cousin's uncle's stepfather. I mean, it's crazy. We can't name how we're related to one another hardly anymore. And then when it comes to the number of children we're having, well... Not very many. And so biological growth in the church has slowed way down. So why do I bring this into it? I bring this into it because if we're going to talk about family theologically. We want to be clear that families are vital to the structure of church and that we want to live in supportive relationship to those families. But if we're going to do that successfully in 2014 and 15, we have to understand that family as it might have been drawn in 1949 or 59 or 69 looks very different than family might be drawn in 2014, 2015. That's my first observation today. Anybody done? Okay, that's good. I can go home now. So I still have 20 minutes. Very close. So the second point about family that I want to make today is the way in which family, and it's again an obvious piece, so forgive me, but I want to, I want to help us understand this, is the seedbed of where all faith comes from. When you have a loving mother and a present father, when you have a father and a mother that are engaged in the upbringing of a child, faith becomes far easier to develop and more automatic in its development than a child who experiences neglect or has loss. You see, when a baby cries, when a baby cries and its cry is answered, and I know how frustrating it is. I've been a parent. Does, is he wet? No. Is he dirty? No. Does he need to be fed? Who knows? Uh, is, he just at, is he in pain? It looks like it. Sounds like it, but no, probably not. What's wrong with this kid? He's just crying. We've all been there, right? You're about to be there. <laughs> we'll, we'll talk to Trevor and Kiri a little bit later um, in this experience. But yeah, you, 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 you're shaking your head. You're going nuts. Does he have a temperature? Is there, you know, what is wrong with this child? Just, just can't seem to settle down. But when a child's cry in normal terms is answered, when they're changed, when they're fed, when they're held, when they're spoken to, when they're nourished, when they're loved, faith develops in a way that it doesn't develop in babies that don't have that, that are neglected, that are left to themselves for long periods of time, that aren't looked at and cuddled and, and nourished and loved. In fact, sometimes these babies grow up to have severe social problems, some of them becoming sociopathic through time. So family as an instrument of nurture and raising is incredibly important, and metaphors that come out of family for mother and father in relationship to God become enormously valuable. A heavenly mother would be responsive to a baby's cry. A heavenly mother would gather her children under her wing, gather her children to her bosom. A heavenly mother would nourish a child. A heavenly mother is responsive and responsible and tender and loving. And this is an image we're given scripturally of our God. A heavenly father is present, is caring, provides, interacts, shapes and forms, disciplines, helps develop character. Presence of mother and father in the lives of a of child make a big difference in this world. And in our metaphoric understanding of who God might be to us as our heavenly parent. Very significant. 
But I want to talk a little bit today about a different aspect even yet of family, and that is the way in which definition of family gets added to in Scripture over time. You see, families are fraught with grace, yes, and nurture, yes, and difficulty, too. We know this from one of the very first stories told of family. Adam and Eve, driven from their garden home, go on to bear children. And one of them will rise up against the other in an unthinkable act of violence, killing his brother. This act of violence and murder, this terrible loss for Adam and Eve, this horrible event that's spoken of right of right after the advent of sin in our world, becomes defining because families are not only a place of nurture and grace, Families are not only places where there's love and discipline and care and formation and all of these kinds of things. They can be places of terrible violence and harm. And it does something to us psychologically in that setting that no other kind of violence can because it's so close to home. And if we're to understand the awfulness of sin and the glory of God in heaven, we have to understand the negative as well as the positive. If family, as God is defining it, can be something wonderful for us, family as it is post-fall can be something devastating as well. So how does that get redeemed? And how does God build back a sense of family in humankind? How does he add to family over time in Scripture? Is it important? I'll let you decide as we get to the end of this. But let's turn to today's passages, starting in Genesis, our Old Testament. Genesis 46. Verse 2, I'm going to start in verse 2. 46, verse 2. Let me set the situation for you. Jacob, Israel as he's known now, has been deprived of his son Joseph for some time. Joseph sold into slavery in Egypt through Amalekite traders by his brothers. A terrible betrayal has been seeing them return to Egypt for food and watching them and observing them and has invited them after revealing himself to them to come to Egypt where he will give them a parcel of land and allow them to live through the drought that has ravaged their own country. And the scripture shares with us that Israel, or Jacob, set out with all that was his, and when he reached Beersheba, he offered sacrifices to the God of his father, Isaac, who was the same God of his father, Abraham, the recipient of covenant and promises. We talked about covenant and relationship to home last week too, didn't we? And God spoke to Israel in a vision at night and said, Jacob, Jacob, here I am, he replied. I am God, the God of your father, he said. Don't be afraid to go down to Egypt, for I will make you into a great nation there, and I will go down to Egypt with you, and I will surely bring you back again, and Joseph's own hand will close your eyes. The son that you've lost will be with you as you pass from this life. Your comfort will be complete. Then Jacob left Beersheba, and Israel's son father Jacob and their children and their wives and the carts that Pharaoh had sent to transport him. So Jacob and all his offspring went to Egypt, taking with them their livestock and the possessions they had acquired in Canaan. Jacob brought with him to Egypt his sons and grandsons, his daughters and granddaughters, all of his offspring. And these are the names of the sons of Israel, Jacob and his descendants who went to Egypt. Now why? I'm going to read these, not because they have particular meaning for us, but because I want you to get a sense of the power of name and the importance of every individual that was part of the family of Israel. Every person to the point that it had to be enumerated and counted and named. Reuben, the firstborn of Jacob, 
the sons of Reuben, Hanok, Palu, Hetzron, and Carmi, the sons of Simeon, Jemuel, Jamin, Ohad, Jake, and Zohar, and Shoal, the son of a Canaanite woman. Even included in the list is the son of one of Simeon's wandering ways. The sons of Levi, Gershon, Kohath, and Merari. The sons of Judah, Er, Onan, Shelah, Perez, and Zerah. But Er and Onan had died in the land of Canaan, it notes. The sons of Perez, Hezron and Hamul. The sons of Issachar, Tola, Pua, Josha, Jeshub, and Shimron. The sons of Zebulun, Sered, Elon, and Jalil. These were the sons Leah bore to Jacob in Padam Aram, besides his daughter Dinah. These sons and daughters of his were 33 in all. The sons of Gad, Zephron, Zephon, Haggai, Shuni, Esben, Eri, Aradi, and Areli, the sons of Asher, Imna, Ishva, Ishvi, and Bariah. Their sister was Sarah, the sons of Bariah, Heber, and Malkiel. These were the children born to Jacob by Zilpah, Zilpa, whom Laban had given to his daughter Leah, 16 in all. The sons of Jacob's wife, Rachel, Joseph, and Benjamin. In Egypt, Manasseh and Ephraim were born to Joseph by Asenath, daughter of Potiphera, priest of On, the sons of Benjamin, Bela, Beker, Ashbel, Gira, Naaman, Ahi, Rosh, Mupin, Hupin, and Ard. These are the sons of Rachel who were born to Jacob, 14 in all. The son of Dan, Hushim, the sons of Naphtali, Jazil, Guni, Jazir, and Shillam. These were the sons born to Jacob by Bilhah, whom Laban had given to his daughter Rachel, seven in all. All those who went to Egypt with Jacob, those who were his direct descendants, not counting his sons' wives, numbered 66 persons. With the two sons who had been born to Joseph in Egypt, the members of Jacob's family which went to Egypt were 70 in all. Now, aren't you glad I didn't have that read for one of our Old Testament readings? Oh, I can barely get through that. I read that again, I want to emphasize, because each name is listed in order underneath each, each parent. Each person has significance. Now, the interesting thing about this passage is that family in Israel's time might look more like family today. Instead of one dad, one mom, and a couple of kids, like would have been drawn in 1949, Family then would have been drawn one dad, two moms, two moms mistresses or servants, and then there would be sons and their wives and then their wanderings as well and their children would be counted. You see how complicated it is? How much more like a modern family, Jacob's family illustrates, than the family of 1949 or 59 in the United States might look like? So there's hope for us. First of all, there's hope for us. Listed in Scripture is the value and place of each one of these people. Now, unfortunately, unfortunately, only the women who bore these children to Jacob are listed, not the wives of the sons and the children that they bore. And so in a society in which women were not counted the same way men, we have that loss in our reckoning. We don't have that information, which would be a part of our record today if we were to list such a, a genealogy. Second point about this passage that I want to make is that it's numbered 66 and then 70. If you add in the two sons who had been born to Joseph in Egypt, members of Jacob's family, which went to Egypt, then were 70 in all. So apparently they traveled up and came back. I'm not sure how that little bit of reckoning works. But there are those who are very fond of looking at Scripture and saying, was it 66, 70, or was it 70-something else? Which we'll get to in just a minute. These numbers that aren't the same prove somehow that the story is made up, that the Bible is false. I hope you don't think that way. First of all, there are logical reasons why the numbers might be the way they are, but more importantly is the fact that each individual is named and these individuals are counted that they're present and valued, that they're part of something bigger, something called family. 
Now notice the initial reckoning counts 66. Did you notice that? With the children and grandchildren Joseph had, or children he had in Egypt, the two who went with him and came back, the number climbs to 70, four more uh, along the way. Now, as I pointed out last week, Joseph would have married an Egyptian, and Joseph's sons likely would have married Egyptians as well. So if we think about what constitutes uh, Jewish nationality today, it's matrilineal. If your mother is Jewish, you're Jewish. Is that not true? So Joseph may have been Jewish, but their mother wasn't Jewish. Would his children have been considered Jewish today? No. Grandchildren? Even less so. In point of fact, his grandchildren would have been less than a quarter, you see, Jewish. But even in the Old Testament, these sons of of Joseph are being incorporated in in the final number of 70 who have gone from Canaan into Egypt. Turn with me to Acts, the stoning of Stephen. Acts. I'm going to have some fun with this. Acts chapter 7. And we're going to start in verse 12. When Jacob heard that there was grain in Egypt, he sent our ancestors on their first visit. On their second visit, Joseph told his brothers who he was, and Pharaoh learned about Joseph's family. After this, Joseph sent for his father Jacob and his whole family, 75 in all. Now Stephen's telling the story. How on earth did he get the number wrong? It was 66, then it was 70, and now it's 75. The answer is this. As Stephen reckons the story, as it comes to be known, two things are going on. First of all, the author here may be referring to the Septuagint version of the Old Greek, I mean the Old Hebrew Bible. And that version has the number 75 inclusive not just of Joseph and his sons, but of his grandchildren. So when Stephen reconciles the number, plus these would have been children already in Egypt, and there is a difference of language here. The number, the whole family number, is reckoned as 75 in all, not necessarily 75 who are traveling. So we have this little bit of discrepancy that becomes a reconciliation. And why I share with that, that with you is because of this. Even as we get to Acts, the definition of Jacob's family is beginning to expand. And even though now the rules of who is Jewish and who aren't, who isn't Jewish are clearly defined, those who would not be considered Jewish necessarily are folded now into the family of Israel. Do you see that happening? And as we read on in Acts, there's going to be a vision Peter has in which all sorts of things that are considered unclean appear to him and he's told to eat. And he doesn't want to eat. He's told he must. And he comes to understand that it's not about clean and unclean, it's about people and who is associated with and who is not, who is counted and who is not. And you know the story of the expansion of the gospel and the expansion of family. Because as Christianity begins, the Gentiles, as Paul puts it, are grafted into the tree. They become part of the family of Israel. They become part of the chosen. Now the adopted has a place next to the natural. And the family definition keeps changing 
and growing. It's a powerful idea because it has implications for us today. In what ways is God calling us to grow our family today? In what ways is God telling us the boundaries need to be expanded? Who's off our list as family that might still be on God's list as family? These are the challenges before us. I want to read to you Psalm 122 again, or a portion of it. It's this glorious ode. I rejoice with those who said to me, let us go to the house of the Lord. House, home, family. Jerusalem is built like a city compacted together where the tribes grow up, go up, excuse me, the tribes of the Lord to praise the name of the Lord according to the statute given to Israel. There stand the thrones for judgment, the thrones of the house of David. Pray for the peace of the city of peace. May those you love who love you be secure. May there be peace within your walls and security within your citadels. And it says in verse 8, For the sake of my family and friends, I will say, Peace be within you. Even in this Psalm, David, long before Acts is written, long before the New Testament begins its incorporation of Gentiles, recognizes that peace is a benefit to the family, that incorporating others, having unity within the walls, brings prosperity and hope and joy and comfort. And when we get to Paul in Ephesians, it goes a different direction yet still. Ephesians 3.14 For this reason I kneel before the Father, he writes, from whom every family in heaven and on earth derives its name. I was saying a bit earlier, our notions of heavenly father or, if you will, heavenly mother are born directly out of our earthly experience. It's amazing how much we cannot escape our social situation and our corporeal existence. However much we want to talk about spirituality, the capacity for faith itself is based in nurture, in the realization that when we cry out, somebody cares and that we're heard. And the capacity for faith itself is grown and expanded on as we make choices and take risks, as we experience both gain and loss, and as we experience grace. And our sense of family expands as we realize that the criteria is more than mere biology. Jesus was confronted about this in the Gospels. He was told his mother and his brothers were waiting, and rather tersely he said, Who are my mother and who are my brothers? I always hated that passage. It just sounds so rude, so mean, so ugly in spirit, so unbefitting a Savior. And Jesus makes an interesting point. He says, I'll tell you who my mother and my brothers are, who my family is. My family are those who do the will of my Father in heaven. That's a whole new vista, isn't it? Now we've transcended biology. We've transcended who the mother is and whether or not the child is really part of the team, part of the Jewish nation or not, part of the chosen or not. Now we've transcended everything and come to a new focus. A brother or a sister is one who does the will of the Father, period, the end. What is the will of the Father? That's worth your study. It's worth your time. It's not something I can easily spoon feed you. I can give you broad strokes. What is the will of the Father? Because everyone who does that is part of his family, part of the family of Jesus, a brother to Christ, a brother to us all. 
Every family in heaven on earth derives its name from the Father, and I pray that out of his glorious riches, this Father may strengthen you with power through the Spirit in your inmost being, so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. And I pray that you, being rooted and established in love, may have power together with all God's holy people, all the Lord's holy people, to grasp how wide and long, how high and deep, is the love of Christ. And to know that this love surpasses knowledge, that you may be filled with the measure of all the fullness of God. You see, knowing you're part of a family or even knowing things about life and the world, even having an expansive view isn't all you need. It's to have experienced the all-encompassing and surpassing love of Jesus Christ that his love surpasses even knowledge, even family affiliation, and that to love him and to do his will is to be a part of something bigger than you can comprehend. It's all about the superlatives here, and Paul rocks at superlatives. He is excellent with superlatives. I like to think I'm pretty good with superlatives, but not a candle do I hold to the Apostle Paul. He is the king of superlatives. Listen to this doxology. Now to him who is able to do immeasurably more than all we ask or even imagine, according to his power that is work within us, to him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations, forever and ever. Amen. Now why does it say throughout all generations if it's not talking about family? Family isn't just those you've given birth to and those they've given birth to and so forth and so on. Family is defined in Christian terms as the church and all those who are in Christ Jesus. All who do the will of the Father who sent us, sent him. It's just a word It's a word of power, and it's a word that gives life. It's a word that's a double-edged sword because, as I said a moment ago, family can be laden with blessing and laden with curse. Family can be a source of comfort or a source of torment. Family can be where we find love unconditional or where our brother rises up in hatred against us and kills us. Human family is fraught with difficulty and fraught with problem. Marriage, this side of the fall, will never be an easy institution. It will always be an institution of grace, but never an easy one. Family will be the crucible of the formation of our characters. But thanks be to God, it goes beyond that which we create for ourselves in our homes. It goes to something God creates for himself because guess what? The home that you're called to live in, you may have a misconception about this. We talk about our mansions in heaven and we treat them like a subdivision in California. I'm going to have a two-acre parcel, grapes out front, small garden back, fruit trees on the side, big Italian cypress down both sides and a wall in the back. It'll be gold. Thank you. Atrium will be like this, and I'm going to live in my little mansion, in my little place. It's, it's, Mc, it's McDonald's. It's McMansion that we think of when we think of heaven. And do you know what Jesus said? I'm coming and I'm bringing the new Jerusalem, and in my city, the city of God, there are many rooms, and I'm going to prepare one for you because you are going to live in my home because you are my family. That's what God says about you. So let's revise our thinking about heaven again. You might have a country home. I don't know. You might have a a home on the planet Zork, for all I know. I really don't care. It's way beyond what Scripture shares with me, and I, I just have no idea. You may ski on the sea of glass, Steve Marshall, for those of you old enough to remember that. I don't know what the story is going to be. There may be a planet that's all downhill, if that's, I, I just don't get it. I, you know, whatever. You may ride a giraffe or pet a lion. I'm, I, 
Not here to tell you. But one thing scripture does say is that you will be living in God's house. And that those who live beside you will be his children, same as you. And what that means is that if he is the father, those who live next to you and with you and around you will be your brothers and sisters for all eternity. Because you'll be God's children together. So let's get used to that now. Let's practice family now. Because what it comes down to is very simple. The world is going to know that we are His, not because of all that we know, not because of how eloquent we can speak to eschatology. Baptismal candidates, you heard that word today. There it is, a bonus for you in the sermon. You know what it means. Wink. Good for you. But because God will be our Father and we will make our dwelling forever with Him.